Uh, this is called How We Turned That Little Green Man. Uh, a lot of people asked me what that little green man was, and thinking to myself, it's a mobile track, what else is going to be? But it's Android for those of you who can't figure it out. Um, again, my name is Matthew Rowley. My Twitter handle is 1T, and I'm a senior security consultant at Modisano. Um, the talk, this talk is just basically a bunch of techniques on how I reverse engineer Android applications um, with specific examples. And at the end, there's a new tool that I've been working on that I'm going to give you guys the ability to download. Um, first, talk about how to gain man in the middle from uh, SSL communication stream in Android. Uh, then move on to static analysis and give you an example of reverse engineering the Skype application and uh, the secret menu that I found in there. Then talk about how to modify an, app, modify an APK uh, without having a source to it and the ability to inject arbitrary Java into an APK. Uh, then talk about some uh, manual debugging and automated debugging of, uh, of applications without actually having access to their source code. So the first technique is, is gaining access to uh, SSL communication stream. Um, I'm assuming that everyone here knows how, what man in the middling an SSL uh, communication stream entails. However, I don't think, I'm not sure that everyone has done it on an Android device. Um, the Android operating system works kind of like your browser. Uh, when you view an untrusted endpoint, it's going to check its local trust store and if, if that endpoint is not trusted, it's going to throw an exception. Um, it's up to the developer of the application whether or not what to do with that exception. Typically, they just fail closed. And um, you can't just you know, put this behind some man in the middle tool that, that uh, creates a uh, custom self-signed cert for you. Um, the red line in that diagram at the top is the cert that's coming back from the attacker of what you're going to actually, um, what's going to be coming back to the Android device and what you're going to have to force it to trust. Um, Two tools that I, I typically use to do this are Mallory and Burp. Mallory uh, uh, uses IP tables to do a, a transparent proxy, and then Burp is, um, I'm sure everyone's uh, used it. So uh, again, SSL is done, uh, is handled by the Android operating system. Um, however, there's an option for developers to take control of that um, negotiation. Um, but this presents two problems when trying to gain access to the SSL communication stream. Is one, the, how do you convince the operating system to trust the endpoint that you're communicating with? And two, if there's a developer check, how do you get around that? Um, so first, um, the operating system checks. Uh, it's got the operating, the Android operating system, operating system has a local trust store. Um, there's two different versions depending on which operating, which version of the operating system you use. Um, there's no interface for installing this stuff. It's, it's either a bouncy castle file that you have to import the cert into or um, a directory that has text-based certs. Before Ice Cream Sandwich, this was the uh, set of commands you'd have to use to actually install a cert onto a device um, and then reboot the device. You have to install the bouncy castle libraries, pull the cert, uh, use bouncy castle to import your cert, remount the system partition, to have read-write access, pull the current CA cert, or change the permissions for the current CA cert, push the new one up, and then change the cert, uh, change the permissions back. Uh, the tool I wrote, Otter Tool, um, oh, sorry, uh, with Ice Cream Sandwich, it's a little bit different. Uh, you can just use OpenSSL to generate the text output, and you push the file back up into the uh, CA cert's directory. Uh, this is the tool I wrote that automates this pretty easily. Um, pull down menu double click the file and it's installed. Uh, this it currently only works with prior to Ice Cream Sandwich. I didn't, I'm, I'm working on the fix to determine which operating system is being used and it will determine how it needs to install it. Um, unfortunately, after that, you have to do, restart the device. And with the emulator, uh, after you restart the device, the system partition defaults back to uh, whatever is specified on the emulator command line or the default one in the configuration file. Prior to revision 17 of the emulator, it would actually, if you specified a system partition or a system image file, it would uh, persist changes to that. After 17, it stopped doing that. And uh, I'm not really sure if that's a bug or a feature. I was talking to one of the developers, and they said it was a bug. Then they never got it fixed, and they stopped responding to my emails. And I'm not quite sure exactly um, what's going on with that. But 
you can use unyafs and make yafs to image to uh, pull apart the image file and put arbitrary files in it. Um, and then again, ice cream sandwich and switch to bouncy castle for, or switch from bouncy, bouncy castle to just a, a directory of text files. Um, another, the, the easiest way that I found to work around this um, system partition uh, persistence or n requiring the persistence because after you install this, you have to reboot the device for the cert to be trusted or the, the chain to take effect. Um, in, at least in Unix and uh, or Linux and OS X, when you start an emulator, it copies the system partition into a temporary directory, um, which is temp android dash your username and then emulator dash some random string. You can, after you make changes to the system partition, you can copy that locally somewhere before powering up the device. And the next time you start the emulator, you specify the system command line option with that file as the uh, as one of the arguments, and then it will take that and do that copy into the temporary directory. So all your changes will, will be in effect if you use that specific image after you changed it. So I was thinking to myself, if I was a developer and I didn't want someone to uh, modify, modify my application, I would, in, or if I it didn't want someone to gain access to that cell communication stream, I would implement this X509 Trust Manager, which is a way that you can um, modify the, the default operating system or inject uh, a code into the default operating system checks on certificates. Um, and you know, this is something that I see a lot in a lot of applications. I'm not sure if it's people trying to prevent this stuff or if it's developers that need to communicate with an untrusted endpoint and don't realize that how to do it and leave that those checks in. But uh, you can get around this by using Backsmall like to decompile the application, then you can modify that small a source re somalia it, then repackage and resign it. Um, this is a set of commands. If you were to do it on a command line, uh, you'd have to again pull it apart, find the the uh, the class that do, that does this custom search check, repackage it, generate a key to sign it, then resign the application, and then install it. Uh, with the tool that I wrote, uh, made it a whole lot easier. You can load an APK directly from the device. Um, and here, this is just an application that I wrote that has a X509 trust manager in it. You can search through the back uh source for the X509 trust manager, double click it from the search, um, modify the method to return void. It's, a, it's a, a void or return, just return before it actually does the check. Uh, if something goes wrong, it throws an exception. It's not, it doesn't return true or false. You can then build it directly from here, uh, which allows you to sign it and generate a key store to sign it with just some checkboxes. A whole lot easier than trying to remember all those command line um, options before. So now, now that you have man in the middle, uh, you can man in the middle of this communication, what can you do and uh, what does this give you access to? Typically, after gaining access to this, you're not gonna be attacking the device anymore. You're now going to use that communication stream to attack these backend services or backend servers. Um, what I've seen is that developers who to create these backend services expect all the communication to come from an Android device and it's, it's uh, correct format. However, as we know, um, correct format isn't always gonna be the case. So some of the, some of the things that I've been able to do from just gaining access to man in the middle uh, SSL stream was uh, 101 read write access of files through a SOAP interface XML entity inclusion that would that allowed me to eventually gain access to the admin SSH private key, um, which was used in their entire infrastructure, and uh, the ability to lock or wipe someone else's a, a device uh, through software. Uh, it was a security software, so if you lost your phone, um, you could you know, wipe your device through a web interface. Uh, now, again, if I was a developer, how would I how would I prevent this? There's, and the problem is that there's really no way to 100% prevent this. Everyone, at some point, someone's gonna be, if, if someone's dedicated enough, they're gonna be able to find a way to see your network communication stream. Um, and you have to remember that this device is outside of your trust zone, so you can't control who's using it and what they're doing with it. Um, so it's just like um, you know, cross-site scripting or SQL, SQL injection, you gotta, you always have to treat the input that you're getting from a user as untrusted. Um, However, you can make it really hard for people to reverse engineer your application. Um, the, the biggest thing that frustrates me is when people 
get the expensive obfuscation software. Um, as you'll see later on, there's really easy ways to get around obfuscation by using strings that is static strings as reference points. But with the, the expensive software, uh, it actually obfuscates the strings as well. So you can't just grep through a source code to find what you're looking for. Um, again, implement custom search checks like we showed before. And a new thing that I actually haven't seen implemented anywhere, but uh, would it, to me seem pretty um, obvious, was to authenticate the application itself through every, through every uh, network request that it's going to it's going to pull. Um, so the APK has access to itself. You can do some sort of custom hash with every request. So when you send that, you can ensure that the application that's your communi that's communicating with your endpoint has not been modified in any way. Um, I'll show an example of how to get around that though as well. So the next technique I'm going to talk about is static analysis. And static analysis, I feel like in general, is a skill. Everyone does things different ways. Uh, there's different paths to get to different to get to the to the same endpoint. Um, but I'll show you guys how I go about doing things, and hopefully it'll uh, it'll help you in the future. First, uh, every every project that I start with, I, I put into a specific directory structure. Uh, four directories: jar, source, uh, unAPK, and unzip. Uh, there's a tool dex to jar that will convert an APK file to a jar file, and then open that up in JD GUI that will uh, show a somewhat decompiled source of the APK. Uh, then the unAPK directory has the smalley source, and the unzip directory just unzips the APK. Um, this is a script that I use that just kind of automates everything. Again, I, I have all the command line stuff in here just for reference. If anyone, I, I actually go back to this a lot to try to figure out what I'm trying, what I'm, what commands I'm trying to run because it's impossible to remember all this stuff. Um, so when I was looking at the Skype application, I saw in uh, logcat messages that it was trying to access uh, Skype.properties file from the SD card and from a specific uh, local to the application. And I couldn't see it anywhere, and I was curious as to what that actually was and what it, what it did. So when grepping through that directory structure that I set up before, I was looking for just the static string Skype.properties. So the, the Skype application is very, very obfuscated. However, they don't do the string obfuscation. And as you can see here, just grepping through the uh, source directory and the back Somali directory, you can see Skype.properties comes up in some of the Somali files. But Doing this setup, I also had the, the Java directory, or the, the source directory, that, which has the decompiled Java source as well. And I thought to myself, why is this coming up in the Somali source, but not in the Java source? Because I would much rather look at Java than Somali. Um, after looking at the two, uh, two methods in the exact same class, I noticed on the top, which is Somali, we, we can obviously see the Skype.properties string. The bottom actually had an error, and it just shows the bytecode that doesn't reference the string at all. So this kind of showed me a very important lesson that you can't always rely on this decompiled Java source. You actually have to go back to the small source at some points. Um, this is one example of when I had to do that. Um, after looking through the small source, you can see that it's, it's this typical Java properties file. It's got key value pairs. Um, and you can see it looking for a specific string like login. And then setting that to a variable and then the type of the variable that it is. So looking through all these, uh, I wanted to test to ensure that my reverse engineering is, is proper, and it's, I'm actually looking at what I what I am expecting to look at. So the one thing that stood out to me was this debug menu, which is halfway down the list. Um, so I tested that. I created a file, put it on the uh, SD card that just said debug menu equals one. Next time I opened up Skype, I saw a debug menu down there, which was awesome. It gave me some extra options like logging. But then on the right screenshot, there was a weird a weird button at the bottom that just says emergency call American Airlines. <laughs> uh, it actually calls American Airlines, not through Skype, with the phone, not still to this day, have no idea why it's there. Uh, but it's cool, it gives you these, these logging options. So enabling those and um, running the application, you can see this is a second of logging while those are, while those are enabled. And you notice on, it, it's, it's a verbose logging, and then it gives you the exact class of where each log message was coming, was coming from. And what we did before was take the static string Skype.properties and then grep through the entire code base to try to find out where that was located. This is the same concept here, except for now they're giving us the exact classes and exact, exactly where all this stuff is happening. So for example, at the bottom there's get conversation message. Um, if I want to know which obfuscated class is dealing with getting messages, found it, they told me it in the logging. Um, so again, thinking about as a developer, how would I prevent this? or 
can I prevent this? If someone was, wanted to reverse engineer my application, again, you can't really. Um, it kind of comes down to a cat and mouse game, uh, unless you're willing to write your own decomp decompiler. But um, you can make it. You can again make it pretty hard for someone. And real obfuscation makes it very, very difficult. When you can't have these static strings as reference points, it's almost impossible to sort search the code. Um, again, disable logging is very, very important. Uh, it doesn't give any. It doesn't give you any reference points to when you perform an action. So, like, if I click a button and then all of a sudden it spits out a log message as soon as I click that, I know exactly in the code where where to look for what that button actually does. And at Black Hat this year, there's a really cool talk called "Practicing Safe Dex" uh, that showed techniques that would cause the decompilation tools to fail and crash, but would allow the application still to run in uh, on the operating system perfectly fine. Uh, it reminded me of old, old uh, anti-reversing tools in the Windows days. Uh, they would create a, a class that had an invalid bytecode in it, um, and it would never be used through the application at all. However, when the decomp decompiler parsed the entire file, it just bonked and, and threw an exception. There's a proof of concept tool, APK Fiscator, as well for that talk. Um, there's links at the bottom, um, the presentation and the tool. Really cool stuff. Um, and I'm not. I'm not really sure how practical that is in a real life environment, but you know, this is the cat and mouse game. As soon as I figure out a way to cause your tool to crash, you're gonna figure out a way to cause it not to crash, but just ideas. So uh, we, at Montesano, we create challenges for each other, and uh, unfortunately, I can't talk about client work, so I had to create this application as a challenge that I'll show you how to get around this, the, uh, the uh, controls that I put in place. It's just called, it's called Hacker Challenge. Um, this is, there's one screen, as you can see on the left. It shows a picture of the hacker's movie. And um, all it does is performs SSL communication with an endpoint. And it pulls down a quote unquote secret, which is just like a, 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 a quote from the movie based on uh, one of the characters. And uh, the goal is to try to figure out all of the secrets for all the characters. And this is all you get is this one button, um, which will pull down zero cool secret. It's got two um, preventative measures. One is the, the, the custom hash of itself, like I was talking about before. So it kind of authenticates itself prior to um, communicating with the endpoint, or while communicating with the endpoint. And as you can see on the left, the error message comes up. If you try to use a, a modified version, it'll say, you've modified it, we're not going to tell you anything. And it has a custom X509 trust manager in it as well. So. Uh, the next technique I'm going to talk about is modifying an application. Uh, typically, like I showed before, when I modified an application, I would just decompile it into source or into the Somali source and then modify that. However, it it doesn't it it's like modifying a binary in a disassembler. Like just looking at the bytecode, it doesn't. Why can't I just put Java right in there? That, so this is this is what's going on in my mind. I want the Java to just get right into that APK. I don't know uh, how to do that though. So the, the logic of a normal compilation path is for a Java application, or for an Android application, is you go from a Java file, you use Java C to convert it to a class file, then it uses DX to convert it to a DEX file, and then it's zipped up or into an APK, essentially. There's some other details, but it doesn't really matter when it comes to this. And then when the modification of what we were talking about before, or what I showed before, was you take an APK, you unzip it to a DEX file, you use back to convert it to a small file, that's when you do the modification. Then you re it to a DEX file, zip it up back into an APK. And then you, you obviously have to resign it and stuff, but again, details that don't really matter in this. Um, so taking those two paths, I found that you can go, on the top is the, the normal, how you'd uh, pull apart an application, modify it, and then, and then pull it, put it back together. On the bottom is a modified version of the normal compilation path. If I can go to get to a common DEX file and then get them to a small a format, I can, hopefully just merge those back together into a DEX file and um, back into an APK. So I can, I want, I want to be able to write Java source file and put it into an APK that I don't have source code to. Um, turns out you can, uh, but there's a, a few nuances that uh, make it a little bit difficult. One is this calling convention that Smalley uses. Um, I'm not even sure where Smalley came from now that I think about it. It's a weird, it's like a mix between bytecode and Java. Uh, it's hard to read and hard to, to um, mess with, but anyways. Uh, and you also have to take into account namespaces. So if I add a, me a method to a specific class, I have to make sure that when I call that method, I'm calling it in the correct namespace versus the namespace that you know, I define. Um, 
So in that in that hackers challenge application, it does a custom like I said before, it does a custom hash of itself, um, which authenticates it to the endpoint. So this is uh, as you said, when you click the button, it says uh, it says I don't play well with others. So that's when um, it successfully authenticates with the endpoint. Um, in Otter Tool, you can load the APK directly from the device. which gets into its Somali format. And I'm trying to find this hashing out. So the goal of this, the, sorry, the goal of this whole video is to try to modify the, the APK to print the hash that is being used to send with the network communication. Um, so I find the, uh, the, method, the method called get file hash, and I can see that it does some stuff, and then it's gonna return uh, an object v2, um, which is gonna be a string see right there. So in this other tab, you can actually take Java. Um, on the left-hand side is just Java. I'm going to create a method that just logs a string. So I've got 1t-debug as the, you know, the key for the debug message and then the argument that's being passed to this method. So after modifying this, um, I can convert it to Somali, which on the right-hand side will do what I was talking about before. I can now take this method directly from there and paste it into this class at the bottom. Um, from there, I have to use the correct calling convention. That's why, so that's why I, on the left-hand side, I called the method in the in main, is just so I can see a reference of how that method's gonna be called in Somali, because I, you know, I don't know why this, it even looks like that, but. <laughs> so after that, you can just copy the uh, calling convention and put it back, so go back to that return value that we want to be able to see. And prior to returning, just simply change the argument to v2 because it's returning v2. And like I said before, you have to make sure take the namespace into account. Right now the namespace of that is Otter Tool, and it's in a class called Hacker Challenge Android Activity. So after we change that, we can save the file, and then rebuild the APK. Which will automatically sign it and generate the key store for you. From here, uh, uninstall the old APK from the application, from the, the emulator, which is running in the background. Yeah, that's what we're gonna. That's gonna be the next demo. Uh, well, cause the, you mean cause the hash hash value of what? Self measured hash. Yeah. So yeah, it's the, you mean the application is authenticating the endpoint, so its hash isn't gonna be the same, and then it's gonna give an error. Yeah. Um, but this will allow me. Uh, this is more of a demo of showing how you can modify an application just by input from Java source code. So what we did was. Uh, just logged a, a message that said 1T debug. Now when running the application, uh, when you call that, it's gonna see, like, you, like what we were just talking about, it's gonna throw an error. Or we were able to successfully modify the application to have it debug a message coming from Java source code. Um, without modifying or creating anything in Somali, we just went from source directly to a modified APK. Um, so, what does that mean in my, in my mind? Uh, it means that any APK that's out there can be modified. And the Google Store, uh, the marketplace, doesn't have checks in place like Apple does. I know there's the new process, but what's preventing me from pulling an APK down, modifying it with a whole set of libraries that I control and then putting it back up there? Um, there's really nothing. Uh, also, cracks for applications that you need to activate. Um, Essentially, you can put any Java into any APK, which is pretty cool. Um, the next technique, so since we, with that application, now it was failed, it failed to um, authenticate itself to the endpoint, and that, thus we got the error that said uh, the APK has been modified. But Android operating system provides you with a whole debugging architecture. It's, uh, it uses the common uh, Java platform debug architecture, which has uh, an API, Eclipse, manages it well. Um, there's a JDB, which is a command line interface, and there's a JDI hook, which is a Ruby implementation of, of a Ruby 
linking to the Java API. Um, the only problem with this is if you don't have source, you, you need to know exactly where you're going to break on these in, in these applications in order to see, for example, the the, the key that we were looking for before. Um, so you can. This is a uh, so. This is gonna. This is a demo of how we can use Eclipse for an application that we don't have source to, to um, modify or to view the hash that uh, we were look that we're, we're trying to trying to find. Since the application can't be modified, we need to find a way of getting that hash because it's it's a custom hashing algorithm. We can't just. It's not an MD5. So first thing you do is is decompile the application into the Java source. Um, this is the script that I that I showed in the beginning of static analysis, uh, but save that source from JD GUI into a directory that's just showing showing the Java files. In Eclipse, we can create a new pro a new Java project, and then copy the source that we just decompiled into that project. Now, and after doing that, we refresh the project in Eclipse. It's going to show that there's a whole bunch of errors, but we don't care because we're not actually going to be running this application. We're, we're just using this as like a, a stub for the debugger on where we want a breakpoint. So that the same method that we were, that we modified before, uh, this get file hash, you can't really tell right there, but I double clicked on the left hand side, and there's a blue dot right here now. Um, that's saying create a method breakpoint at this specific method. Um, there's in in the Java debug architecture, you can create breakpoints on methods, and you can create them on line numbers. So in order to do one on a line number, it's not going to work because the source isn't, is, isn't the exact source that we uh, that was used to compile the application. But the, method num the methods, uh, we can actually breakpoint on. So after double clicking that, in the debug view, you can see that that method was, um, the breakpoint was created on that. So we want to see the return value, so we want to have it break on exit which is that return string. So this is just showing that method as what it actually does. Uh, it iterates through a string and then does something, it concatenates to it and then returns that value. So in the emulator, uh, I don't know when this changed, but in the development settings, there used to be this option to debug an application. Um, you can select it and then force it to wait for a debugger prior to running. Uh, the new versions in Ice Cream Sandwich don't actually have a GUI to do this, but I'll show you the command line way of doing it. So you select the Hacker Challenge, um, click wait for debugger, and then when you run it, it's going to show you a dialog box saying, I'm paused waiting for a debugger to attach before I can continue, continue running. Now in, in the DDMS view, you can see that there's a remote Java process and a specific port on here, um, which is what we're going to be using to connect this debugger to it. So when you create, you can create a new uh, remote debugging um, application on here, which we add the source that we just pulled down, or that we just imported into that project as the reference, so all the breakpoints will work. And then we set the specific port to what we saw in the DDMS view. Now, after running, after clicking debug, you can see there's a bunch of errors in the project, but we don't care because we're not actually running the project. We're just using that as a reference. Now, the application ran. Now, when I press it, click this button, Clips is going to pop pop up saying we uh, hit a breakpoint and we want to switch over to the debug view and click yes. We can see that the, that we broke. Um, but like I said before, the line numbers don't match up. So when the breakpoint hits, the, uh, the uh, the application says we hit a breakpoint on this specific line number. So when looking at this view, if you can see on the bottom, it thinks that the breakpoint was on that line of code. But since our, our line numbers don't match up from the uh, decompiled source to the legitimate source, it's not going to line up properly. But if we start stepping through the application, um, we can see that this is the, the method that we did want to break on. It does some stuff, and then it creates a variable uh, string, and then iterates through some array, um, and continues. When 
when we start stepping through this portion of the application, we can see that it's going to create a result variable and then an I like that exists just like where the breakpoint was hit or where, the, where we wanted to break, which lines up directly with this method. Now, when we start stepping through it, we'll see the results um, start adding characters to that's going to be the hash of what we're actually wanting to see and the I value increment. But since we had a, a exit breakpoint as well, we don't actually have to step through all this. We, we know that that string is going to return at the end. So when we play, it's going to hit the exit breakpoint. And we can look at the variable, and then we see the legitimate hash of how the application authentic authenticates itself to the backend architecture. Um, that was a lot of work to get very little stuff. But um, it showed me the way how cool debugging can be and how, how useful debugging can be when um, reverse engineering an application. Uh, to me, it seemed like it was it was like if you were using Immunity Debugger or Ally Debug or GDB to debug a binary, but it just gives you more information. Like, oh, here's the variables that are existing in this application at this point in time, and you know, certain applications you actually call, can call methods on them there. Uh, but not not only can you create breakpoints on methods within the application, but you can also create breakpoints on core Android and core Java methods as well. So something like intent, or as you're going to see with this next tool, crypto stuff. So th the way I found this technique um, was reversing an, uh, an application that I was trying to find what the AES secret key was um, and the initialization vector. And it was very obfuscated code, and I, had, I, couldn't, I couldn't follow it. It was, it was that obfuscated. So originally, I was going to write this tool that was going to be part of Otter tool that would allow you to do this type of stuff and just show you the variables similar to like Eclipse did, but without having to um, go through the whole, that whole process. Um, but then I started thinking about this, and this whole um, idea was kind of bigger than just Android. It's, it's the Java debug architecture. So I created a new tool called, uh, with two tools, Java Tap and Crypto Tap. Crypto Tap um, just automates that and prints out any encryption related information um, from a Java application and allows you to attach to a remote process like we were just like we just did in Eclipse, or it allows you to launch an application just from the, the command line. Um, uh, Java Tap is kind of an abstract version of that. It allows you to just create a configuration file that just says entry or exit and uh, what method you want to break on, and it just prints out the associated information. So I was going to create a video for this, but I've never done a live demo before, so we're going to try it out right now. Um, all right, so I've got this, I've got this Java application right here. Um, this is the source for it. So all it, all it does is takes, can you guys see that right? Um, all it does is takes ciphertext and encrypt, or decrypts it, and then uh, takes a, a plain text and encrypts it. It doesn't output anything. But uh, the goal is to try to figure out, without having a source, how to figure out the uh, initialization vector, the secret key, and whatever is encrypted. Uh, so when you run the tool, you can see that there's a bunch of command line options. Is that big enough? Um, this one we're just gonna is, is part of the part of this jar. So right here we, we call open the jar, call launch specify the class. This, this launch argument is just basically if you were going to launch a Java application, what arguments would you put after the Java command line? So dash class path, the same jar because the main method exists in there. And then this is the main, the method that, or the main, the class that has the main method that we want to call. So when I run that, it's actively debugging essentially what we're doing in Eclipse before, except for looking for these specific things. As it runs, you can see it prints out all of the encryption information that's associated with this. If you, uh, this is a very simple example in, in what I was doing for testing, but if you can use this on more complicated applications and just, just run it and pulls out crypto keys for you, you don't have to do anything. Pretty cool, in my opinion. Um, and then, so this, that was just a Java application, right? Um, and this is an Android talk. So again, wanted this to work on Android. However, this is what happens when you. Uh, so it's the same, same, same 
same source as what I showed before. Um, it just put in an Android application that prints out something to Logcat. Now, this is a, there's a command line um, option, a command line tool, which is right here, uh, the AM application manager, that allows you to, to, to force the application to wait for a debugger before running. Uh, the command is shown on the next screen. But next, now when I run this, it's going to wait for the debugger. When I, I can use DDMS to see the port, and then you, when I call the crypto tap with the remote port, um, and look back at Logcat, you can see bad things happen, really bad things. Uh, if anyone's seen a stack trace in Android before, uh, this was a Java application, however, it's crashing on hard, not on anything Java related. So there's no native code that was associated with this application, however, it's throwing a six up crash. Kind of weird, but um, I sent this bug to the developers at Android and no one has responded to me, so hopefully they'll fix this soon. I have found another technique to do the same thing um, with other calls in the Java API that kind of works, but it's not there yet, so I think I'm gonna, but then that version doesn't work with the just the raw Java version, so I think I'm gonna make two versions of this. Right now the um, crypto tap version that was shown in that demo will be available at the end. Uh, this was the command line option of uh, the account manager that allows you to uh, force an application to uh, wait for a debugger, like I was talking about before. There used to be, uh, in the dev tools of Android, the ability to do that. However, they took that GUI feature away. Uh, but this is a way to do it from the command line. So again, thinking from a developer's perspective, how can I prevent this? Um, and again, I haven't found a way to. Uh, I may be doing this wrong, but in the Android manifest file, there's a debuggable option that, I, I literally tested this yesterday. <coughs> you can set it to false, and I would assume that means that you can attach a debugger to it. Um, except for doing that exact same thing that I was doing before, allowed me to attach a debugger to it. So I, th I would assume that's supposed to prevent it, but it apparently doesn't work. Um, and even if you do have that option there, you can use uh, APK tool to decomp decompile the APK, uh, modify the manifest file to turn that to true, and then you know, re repackage it and repackage it and reinstall it. Um, so Otter tool, like I was, what I was talking about before, was, was kind of the the uh, start of why this whole talk exists. Um, there's a whole bunch of other features in there, like a live file file browser, which allows you to uh, see SQLite database, databases, uh, text files, and hex files. Um, oh, so this is directly from the device, too. It doesn't pull anything down. Um, well, it does pull stuff down, but it, you, it's behind the scenes. Uh, there's file system differ that allows you to scan the file system in two different points in time and see what files have changed on the device. Uh, an ability to vis uh, visualize, the, 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 visualize the Android manifest file and it puts out, uh, highlights key places on uh, places you can look from a security perspective. And uh, that's it. Uh, again, my name is Matt Raleigh, uh, Matthew at Montesano. There is a, uh, Otter tool can be obtained on GitHub. The crypto tap is right there. The slides are there as well. And my one plug is that if anyone's looking for a job in security consulting, send me your email, uh, New York City, Chicago, or Mountain View. Any questions? All right, well, thank you guys.